Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. And it's it's an absolute delight to be running another growth story with my good friend, uh, Jessica Pillow. So in today's growth story, we're chatting with Jessica, who runs uh, the award-winning, how many awards now? Or don't you have enough hands anymore? Uh, or fingers, yeah, the award-winning Pillow May. And hello, Lena, hello, Matt, hello, El Elena. Good to see people joining us. Do let us know where you are in the world in the chat box. Lovely to know where you are. So um, you were, I think, one of my first accountancy firms I think I coached. There've been a couple before you, but we won't say anything about that. Um, and after a break of a few years, you were the first person to sign up for the uh, for the Accountants Millionaires Club. You're now a um, advisory board member of the club, as well as a long-term uh, friend of the family. So. Jessica, great to have you with us. Um, do you want to give us a quick potted history of your firm, such as what prompted you to start it? What is your current turnover? Okay, yeah. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, so um, I set up Pillow May um, just after the birth of my first of my daughter. Um, I was in partnership at the time. Um, I'd had a lot of problems having babies um, and went back to work um, after two and a half months maternity leave at the beginning of January and worked crazy hours um, whilst my mother, mother and mother-in-laws held the baby in the background to be told that I wasn't giving enough to the business. So frankly, at that point, I just thought I can't physically give any more here. So, <laughs> so, um, so I left the partnership and set up Pillow May and really one of the really big reasons for that was to really prove to the profession that you could be work part-time and still deliver an amazing accountancy service and to enable um, particularly working mums to have a career um, in accountancy because I couldn't see any reason why you couldn't be a mum and an accountant at the same time so that was the real reason for setting it up and you know that's still really um it's still a real strong sort of purpose I think for me um now sort of 13 years later so it's still really it's still I mean it's got better definitely um, in, the, in the industry as a whole, but I, I still think, you know, there's still more to be done. So that's still really important. Um, so now, about now, I have about um, nine, a team of, well, 10 actually, um, <laughs> and a turnover of just over 400,000. Yeah, I know. It's, it's quite, it's when you get to that point, you're like, how many staff do I, oh, it's that many. And yes, it's like, well, I think we've got this many, oh, but there's somebody joining up, absolutely. And I think you and I very much started our own businesses with that viewpoint of there's got to be another way you've got to be able to be able to fulfill your potential at work without having to be either or with your family so I think that's one of the reasons you and I I mean our kids aren't that dissimilar in age so as this is about a growth story rather than putting the world to rights as a working mother um, let's go into a bit of your growth so what decisions did you make that truly accelerated your your growth what was it that made the difference um, I think it was once my son was born, so he's um, just under two years younger than my daughter. Um, so I'd been running the business about just over a year by the time he came along. <laughs> I think it was once I got him out of the way <laughs> and I decided yeah. I wasn't having any more children. So at least I wasn't going to need any more maternity leave because that's quite tricky to manage, um, particularly if you're on your own in business. Um, but once I'd sort of decided that's where I was, then that was when I started looking for employees and looked to start to sort of take the business forward a bit more. So initially, I just had the, um, I just had the, the sort of, um, you know, my initial personal contacts, really. I took a couple from the partnership who were really my contacts, but that literally, I think I took five or six clients and everything else I had to build up um, from scratch. So it was, it only built up slowly in the first year, really, year or so, because I knew I was going to have to take maternity leave. So obviously I didn't want too many clients. Um, but once that once that was out of the way, then then I really started growing. Mm. So um, you, you had, shall we say, we were talking about this before we came on. Like, there's no easy way to say it. But what did you start on the day that you found out you had cancer in 2016? So, <laughs> so um, a few months before that, I'd realised that um, that I wasn't going. Oh no, Andrea, you're talking about me. <laughs> Yeah. I was thinking about the price rise. So I also did a major price rise, which came into effect on that day as well. Yeah, it was came into effect, July, didn't it? Yeah. Really, first of July 2016, I think it was, was a really, really big day for more than for numerous reasons. Um, <laughs> so um, so uh, I'd kind of been doing a lot of work in the practice prior to that because I was going to go to France as well um, just after that in, in August 2016. So I'd been working with Heather to um, to improve the processes in the business 
um, so that the um, so that I could go to France and run the business full time, but not be physically in the business. And that meant that the, all the team needed to know what they were doing. So I spent a lot of time doing that. And in the process, ended up developing a fax management software um, <laughs> out of that, which I crazily decided to run. And I ran for about 18 months and then decided, actually, you really can't run two businesses properly. I really think you need to focus. They're, they're so overwhelming, the business. And I love running a business, but it's so overwhelming that I think to run two is really, really hard. Um, so that was a really positive thing that came out of M3H, to be honest. Um, that really helped. But um, I also decided to put my fees up by about 30%. And that also came in on the 1st of July, 2016. And in fact, is the only reason I think that Pillow May continued because I, for the first time, had some money coming into the business that I could pay for somebody to replace me while I um, obviously had to take quite a bit of time out to work. So um, yeah, it was kind of, it was a big time. <laughs> and um, I'd, I'd made a lot of decisions which allowed Pillow May to continue. And I think that's the really important thing here is that there were two things. So as you said, you'd you've been working to systemize and get everything in place so that you could be out of the country for a year but still run your practice inadvertently that inadvertently that helped uh oh, go away inadvertently that that helped uh you not be around for when you were going through chemo and surgery but also that large repricing as you say allowed you to afford somebody to come in and do that and it's amazing how many people when they do that 25 percent 30 percent 35 i mean i've been having was having conversations last week where practices were going to put up their fees about 30 to 50 percent i mean they're woefully undercharging but this is often the point that when you put that in place you've finally got a bit of headway to actually employ the right people not work crazy hours um and you know have you seen that before in other people where they get this finally put in this big stonking price rise to price properly and it just makes all the difference with their growth yeah i think so but it's having the confidence to do that it's all about confidence certainly pricing yeah. is and yeah it's kind of feeling that you're worth it and i think you have to get your system sorted almost to feel worth it yeah to feel you've got something to sell if you know what i mean and something of, of substance and, and i think you're right there a lot of us come into an accountancy practice and what we do is we charge rock bottom because that's the way we're going to get people to come to us. And it's, as you and I know, it's so much higher to lift up fees, much easier to lower them down. And there's so much head talk. Am I worth it? Am I not worth it? Will my clients leave? In fact, of all last week, I think I had about four conversations with people about you need to do this fee increase. You're woefully under market rate. And, and they were going to put fees up between 25% and 100%. And each of them said, we're going to lose 30% of the client base. And I said, no, you're not. I said, if you lose more than 5%, I'll be very surprised. If you lose more than 10%, because they were men of faith, uh, I didn't feel it was right doing a bet with men of faith, uh, that actually I'll make a donation to a charity of your choice. You know, uh, But it is amazing how much of that head talk. So you know, you've worked with a business coach to help you with that head talk. But what else has that business coach helped you do to, in terms of to accelerate your growth um so well that's you isn't it the business coach <laughs> well yeah 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 move on move on I think you had a dalliance with someone else for a couple of years but we won't go there we I don't remember that well they really didn't leave much of an impression did they <laughs> so, um no the biggest thing was definitely systemized yeah. the systems and processes and that still to this day remains incredibly important we're just redoing systems again now you know you've got a, the whole time I think a lot of accountancy particularly the compliance side um oh well and also any delegation you do you need good systems because yeah. otherwise you can't get a consistent service really and a consistent yeah. you know and that's so important the consistency and also the way you do it like the pillow may way is a different way than anyone else does it but that's what our clients love and respect and you know want to see continue so you have to make sure that that can, that's delivered over the whole team mm, mm. and, and to think, me systems and processes is the only way to do that really and i think you, you said something that's really really important the pillow may way and you've got to in your own firm find your right way your way of doing things if you continually borrowing a bit from someone here and borrowing a bit from someone there you'll end up with a firm that isn't yours and what you've all got to do as you say is build that special culture that makes you tick, that builds the stories, that builds it. And that's what's going to be the glue that takes your firm from one to two to three people into the tens to the half a million. 
So what stuff has stopped your growth with the benefit of hindsight? Um, people. Yes. <laughs> always people. Getting, yeah. getting the right people in the, in the right places has always been tricky. Um, and we now do a lot. We spend a lot of work profiling so we profile everybody as part of their second interview um and we're kind of we i know the pe the personalities i can't work with um mm. there aren't very many but there is there is a particular personality i just cannot work with i've had a couple of horror stories <laughs> from that particular personality and i just know that that isn't that's not yeah. something i can work with so that would instantly cause me to go i can't i literally can't take this person on because i just know we'll have so many problems um and it literally last week we did a big training day you know um a whole morning all on all on this personality profiling to help the team understand because we were having a few issues with communication and mm. sort of respect amongst the team and things and it was just really about trying to find a halfway house between all the different personalities that we now have and the introverts and the extroverts and um that kind of thing so that's that's been massive for us i think i really noticed once i've done that profiling suddenly i was able to understand how to how to work with different people because I'm not a detail person which is odd as I'm an accountant but um, and so I actually find it really hard to work with detail people and I have to write instructions for detail people other because if, if I say them I'll just literally say about three words and expect them to go off and do it um, which is fine for some of my more senior staff and some of my bigger picture staff but, but a lot of my the rest of my team need you know need a, a lot more detail so um, that was really all that trying to be aware of these you know of, of all these sort of different quirks of people um, is so important. And I don't think you realise how important it is. And you certainly don't learn in your accounts exams about how to work, with, how to deal with people and manage. And, and I, I, I don't think there's any substitute for experiences working with these people, because I mean, I've been oh, what, 20 years plus delivering courses on helping people lead and manage people. But it's only now I've got a team of 10, 11, 12 type stuff that I'm realizing that there is no substitute for doing it. And you're absolutely right. It's because you and I, we're perfectly sensible. We're very, you know, we're very bright. We do things for the right reasons. But some of the time we're like, our team go, what? And you have somebody go off on the deep end and what? You, and you go, but I only said good morning. And, and it, it's knowing all these nuances, isn't it? And, and, and how much more you have to bring the stuff that's out of there on there. So I know one of the things that, you and I have talked about is your working hours so when do you recognize you were too chargeable that you're working too many hours and, and how did you stop letting the business control you um I think that was my mum so um <laughs> so I came I came back into the business after breast cancer um in March 2017 and um I was in France at that point so I had managed to get to France and my mum was uh, I was staying with my parents in their house and um it is always busy March because we do a lot of tax planning so, you know, so mum was like, okay, fine, she's going to be really busy in March. And I'd said I'll be busy because obviously, you know, I'm kind of catching up a bit as well. And, you know, because I'd had the whole of February off. So I knew it was going to be busy. And, and when we got to the 1st of April, she went to me, but now you're still working evenings. Why the hell can that not wait till tomorrow or even two weeks time? Why has it got to be done tonight? Does it really affect the client if you don't, you know? And um, she was absolutely right. And it was just a mindset that I needed to change, really. And um, she, I'm so grateful to her for change, changing my mindset and making me realise that actually, hang on a minute, you know, I was the one who needed to be in control of this. And I needed to set the client expectation, not the client telling me, you know, I needed to stay. And I do that now a lot. And, and people never mind you saying, you know, I'm really sorry, I'm not going to be able to deliver it to now. Or if they do mind, then we can negotiate and I can, you know, I can rejiggle things in my diary if I need to. But in most cases, I don't need to. If I say to a client, it's going to be two weeks. Lots of times they go, that's fine. You know, it's not it's not life or death. I can wait two weeks. That's absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think it was having the, yeah, the mindset change to realize. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I know that's a lot what I do as a coach. It, it, and, and I know Ian, who's who's um, listening in, does it as well. It's that challenge of does it need to happen now? What's in your diary? And getting that structure and that that. But it's got to come from you. You can have external people telling you, but until you really recognize it, it, it doesn't happen. So I know and that diary management. Oh, my God. That was the other thing that I really learned when I was ill. You know, I had to when I suddenly had to reduce my time by, you know, two thirds, I had to go through my whole diary and we had to block out uh, one and a half weeks. And then each month where we, we knew I wouldn't be able to do anything. 
And then we'd have like a half a week where it was like really a bit dodge and then a week where I hopefully was going to be OK, but not to full capacity, you know, and then and then we had to work out what were we going to fit in those slots, you know, what absolutely had to be done by me. And um, whilst I don't have to be quite as officious with it now, it's that that um, sort of regime and stuff I still carry through now and I'm really, really, really strict. On, on my diary and that definitely helps me you know juggle so all the many different tasks you have to juggle as a business owner and, and I think it's interesting you are as a result of that horrible period in your life you are one of the most disciplined I know about your self-care you will turn around to us and go look I'm struggling at the moment um, I can't do that can we do it virtually instead of traveling and then I'll be all right and manage your energy level so and, and I think this is really important. You can only, you have to have the right mindset. So I know you've mentioned a little bit about the chemo and so how you only had one week in three that you could work and you you worked out. What other stuff did you do to keep the business ticking over when you couldn't be that present within the business? Um, so I, well, I was incredibly lucky that my best friend happened that she had worked with me a little bit. Uh, she'd helped cover her maternity leave and then she'd had her own ba baby and she was about to come back into the job market. And so I kind of said to her, would you job share with me? And, and that was massive. Um, but the only reason she could do that was because we'd managed to systemize all my role. And so yeah. my tasks were written down. So we we basically decided which of my tasks she was going to do and which of the tasks I was going to do. Um, and and lost, she was doing a lot of review work and, you know, things like that. She couldn't do tax, but that was OK. That, you know, you had to look at what she could and couldn't do. But um, that was massive. But the fact it was already written down, we already had task lists. We already knew what I did. If you know what I mean, <laughs> made it so much easier to then just go, OK, this is my role. How are we going to split this role again? Kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, it, and in my case, as I'm gradually reducing my hours and moving into a slightly different role as, as the business is growing, you know, I'm like you, I'm needing to reduce my chargeability. And it, it is that really writing down, what am I doing? Do I need to be doing that? Who else could be doing that? And I know for me, having a really, I call Alison and Alison may be listening. Um, I call her the big guns because she, you know, I just say, yes, whatever Alison says goes, you know, she, she manages my diary massively. And I know that if I give her something and I know, how did, how did having, appointing a PA in that period for you helped too. Yeah, yeah, I was just about to say, yeah, PA is the other one that makes a huge difference. And I mean, God, we wouldn't be doing system changes now and everything else if I didn't have this amazing PA who makes happen, where I come up with the idea and I say, okay, that's what we're gonna do. I don't make it happen, she makes it happen. <laughs> and she's ruthless at making things happen. And she also chases clients and she keeps our, our whole, like, I call it a sausage machine, you know, of doing accounts. She keeps that going. She's looking out for the, for, you know, for the cogs that have got all the sort of things that got yeah. stuck. And um, that, that aren't moving still. And, and she's the whole time, that's what she's looking at. And, and that's what keeps the practice going and what keeps it efficient and what keeps everybody else able to do their work. So. And, and, and I think it's so important to recognise your energies as a founder, because what you've really described is you are the visionary and you, with your PA, you've got an integrator. Whereas a visionary, as you say, you're top level, you're often with the biggest clients, but you know, you're spontaneous. Whereas actually you've built in somebody whose management is their thing, that they are very, very good about making the systems happen, looking for, as you say, the broken bits. And that's what Alison does in our business. That's what Lisa does in our business. And in fact, within each of our business units, we, we're trying to match up the visionary energy with the integrator energy. So we've got that very complementary going forward. So yeah, and taking those strengths you know, and the, the personality strengths and things and, and matching those to the to the service levels and the service areas, yeah. um, you know, um, is, is, yeah, we spend our whole time doing that, really, juggling roles and, and tasks and things. So yeah. they're with the right person who's got the right kind of strengths to deal with those tasks. Absolutely. So, you know, I know from other cancer survivors, it's not just the original diagnosis. It's not just the surgery. It's not the six months, 12 months, 18 months, two years of chemo. It's a number of years after that before you kind of get back to your old self. So how did you find the resilience to come back from this period in your life? You know, how did you get back from the fight for your life into something else? Uh, it must be my team, definitely, because I was really worried when I knew I was getting cancer and then I was going to have to come out of the team and I'd always felt as the leader you have to create the buzz and really you know the team are kind of following you if you know what mm. I mean and you're creating the buzz and then they're following that buzz and I was really worried about what if I'm under strength isn't that going to pull the whole team down but because I was very open with why I was under strength 
the team actually pushed me up and supported yeah. me. And that support went on for quite a while. So um, going to France immediately after I you know, had finished my chemo and radiation was incredibly important. It gave me that space, enough space from the business, but able still to be involved in a, in a beautiful part of the country, you know, and able to, and I did quite a lot of exercise and got myself stronger again physically. Mm. Um, but was able to keep running the business, but not be completely, it wasn't completely on top of me. That geographical distance actually really helped. Yes, um, yeah. And the team, I think because I wasn't there all the time, the team had to had to stand up yeah. because I wasn't there to quickly ask, you know, can I just do this? So that was really good um, for the business. And that sort of continued for about 18 months. It took me a long time really to get my, my sort of mojo back again. So, and I didn't really push it. It was just like, we'll just do what we do. We'll just, you know, we'll just, we'll just, do whatever we can do so we didn't change a great deal but we we just kept going you know what I mean? which was fun I think we still grew a bit but we just kept going and then and then suddenly I was like right it's our 10th birthday in 18 months what are we going to do now what's our new target going to be and what you know and I was like oh hang on a minute <laughs> I think my major is back here because <laughs> suddenly I had this energy and this vision to take it forward again um but actually it was really interesting that it didn't do the it didn't really do that much damage to the business maybe we were lucky because we were quite forward thinking at the start of the of the pro process so yeah. you know to lose two years of sort of moving forward didn't matter too much for us because like we'd already done zero and you know receipt bank and those kind of things so so we we weren't behind the pack if you know what I mean so we probably maybe had that time yeah and I think too many people in my experience think that you've just got to keep pushing forward and actually pressing pause might be the right thing for you to do for, for and as you've proven it as you said you you took two years where you and, and I've, I've sat there in meetings with you you've gone we're not growing but we're getting loads of referrals and you you know were very very careful that it was only basically you weren't taking on new clients and if you did they had to be very special uh you know still like doing that. Pink, generally <laughs> yeah, we're still doing that because um unless they're special we don't want to work with them and um we just get overloaded so quickly <laughs> so it's the constant focus I have to look at you know is, is the is the new client chat you know I'm constantly having to turn on and off because I'm really worried about my my whole team's welfare you know and if if we push ourselves too much none of us can cope and the whole thing goes you know so that's like for me that's almost the, the most important bit is just managing and it's it's not really the continuing work that kind of happens it's the it's just the new clients come in they have such massive demands to get them into our sort of yeah. you know into our processes and stuff um and they're the ones that really knock us off so i have to that's a continual focus for me and yeah and i think you know it's so many people get an ego kick and go, oh, we've added quarter of a million on this year or quarter of a million in two years or we've tripled within three years. Or you and I were talking about an accountant recently that's grown from naught to half a million in three years. And you know what? That's fine for some people, but it's not about when you get there. It's about enjoying the journey and being present in the moment. And that, and I think so many accountancy earners, own owners don't enjoy the journey. Yeah, and um, yeah, if you make it too stressful, yeah. you know, it's not it's not pleasant for anyone. It's oh. not pleasant for me, and it's not pleasant for the team. And I also think you have to control your business, yeah. you know, or it will control you. And I'm always saying that to my to my um, clients as well. You know, yeah. you've got to be in control. So you've got to be clear what you're trying to do with this business. Yeah, and then you've got to control it. And that the same applies to me too. You know, we need to be clear on our vision and what we're doing, where we're trying to get to, and how yeah. we're going to get there. Absolutely. So um, you've talked a little bit about how important the systems are and you've been really since about 2014 continually streamlining, streamlining, optimizing these systems. Um, but how do you do the streamlining thing and how do you get your team working the same way? And just give us a bit of a sneak preview of what's in your tech stack right now, because I know that's <laughs> what they're wanting. <laughs> So, um, oh, it's just well, something we're really trying to work on now is just ev trying to get everyone into the mindset of going, is this the best way I could be doing it? And if it isn't, then let's bring it to the team meeting. So we now have regular monthly service line meetings, and those are really focused on the processes. So prior to that, when we first started, we would literally hold a meeting and, and write down what we wanted the process to do. So that was a, a meeting that was you know way back, but that's how we originally did it. We had a you know a flip flip chart, and we literally wrote down what is each step. And who's doing that step and you know when should that happen in terms of yeah. the timeline of the job and you know and, and all of that so so that, that's what we did to define it 
And now we have it, like literally every month, we, we sit down and we go, what's working in that system? What's not working? You know, what was a good example? What was a bad example? What can we learn from that? What do we need to change? You know, um, what's not working so well in our tech stack? What, you know, and why isn't it? Let's look into that. Let's, let's get hold of our account manager and try and, you know, work out if there's a better way to do it. So we're, we're doing that all the time. So that's a, a continual focus, um, definitely. So um, just recently, um, I haven't, we haven't talked about it, but um, we are hoping to, expecting to buy a practice in a couple of years, which will double us. So I'm obviously very aware of that. And I'm aware that the systems that I need for a bigger, more disparate practice, and in fact, it's become more obvious since COVID, as people work more hybrid, that um, we needed a stronger system. Um, so we, I've sort of been looking for a way. So at the moment, we use Trello for our job management. And that's great. It's been really good for defining our processes because it's so flexible. Um, but now we need to get them a little bit more structured. We need to have them so that people can't just change them and they can't yes, just decide yeah, yeah, this is how we're gonna, this is how we're gonna do it, or they don't follow them or whatever. Um, so we kind of it's been great for defining how we want them to be. So now we need to go a bit more grown up and go slightly more structured. Um, but at the same time, we've got to watch the costs because as we all know, particularly in small practice, our margins are tight. You know, there isn't that we can't just go and get like a, an amazing sales force, you know, and automate everything through that because it's too expensive. So yeah. we've got to got to be careful. So um, and also it needs to be integrated because otherwise we're spending all our bloody time, you know, with out of date databases and it's just a nightmare, which is where we are at the moment. So um, so we're really excited. <laughs> we're very excited and it's kind of scary. Um, and I have to say it was a difficult decision because um, we'd had a problem with zero payroll and I'd really lost a bit of trust with zero and I'd kind of come away from zero. And anyway, I said to them in November, I'm thinking I might come back towards you. Um, what are you going to do? And um, they've been absolutely amazing, I have to say. You know, their support has been really outstanding. So I was like, oh, OK, you do still want us to be customers. You are happy to, to support us. So we're going into Zero Parts Manager um, alongside FYI, uh, PI, which we already use, because that's very strongly integrated. Yes. Um, and then um, we've already got Microsoft. And we're putting across, above Microsoft and XPM is, a, um, is FYI Docs, which is an Australian um, practice management system. Um, and it's it's very strong on sort of process automation. Um, so I'm re I'm really excited, um, and it also it also does filing as well. So at the moment we have Dropbox, but again the same thing. It's too flexible. You know, people can put folders wherever they like and make up a new folder system. And I'm going, no, it's got to be like this. Yeah, you know, we're spending our life trying to hold it into a structure. You know, and, and that's becoming more and more difficult. It's not everyone's in the office, or you know, and people are working different hours and whatever. So um, so yeah, so we kind of made the decision right. We just got to get a bit more structured here. So um, yeah, and I think that's so important is when. There, there does come a point in your accountancy firm's life where it didn't matter that so-and-so opened up a new folder there. It didn't matter at all. But we're now at that point where we're going, oh, oh my goodness, I think is the right word for, for the take to go. And I'm just looking at some of these folder structures and going, yikes. And we need to do this big cleanup job. So there, there, is, there is this transitional point, isn't there, where it's it's you and the small team against the world. And suddenly it's you trying to get the small team to work in the same way without too much back chat. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, but I have to say, having that flexibility whilst we were working out how to do it. Yeah. Was really good because the M show was quite rigid. And that was it for us was one of its problems. It was too rigid. We couldn't you know, we couldn't sort of, we, and at that point, we didn't have it well enough to find. So for me, there is almost a step, you know, the Trello Dropbox step has been fabulous for us. I mean, you could go one drive or Dropbox, wouldn't matter. But, yeah. you know, that kind of flexible step while, you, while you're still relatively small to really work out how it works for you and your team. But then mm. there comes the point where I felt we needed, now we know how we want it to work. Now we need to find a product that will allow us to work in that way. But but lock in that structure and say that is the pillow may way that's the way and doesn't mean we can't change it because we we can because we've actually we found a, a reasonably flexible structure as well but it's got enough structure you yeah. know whereas unfortunately the way the way trello works is it's completely flexible which is yeah. it's great in many ways but sometimes quite frustrating as well as you get a bit bigger yeah and i think that's a really important point is is it depends where you are if it's just you and two people you can be that flexibility um, and I think for those of you who haven't come across our FYI docs, probably the best way of talking about it is, is it takes XPM and it makes it a really good bit of kit again. And, and you don't see the clunkiness of XPM and you've got effectively a really good task flow, project management, client communications, file storage system. 
So we got we've got four more minutes left. So if anybody's got any questions for Jessica, put them into the uh, put them into the chat box, and I'll pose them to there. So I ask everybody this question, Jessica, but what are the challenges you're facing right now as you plot your next phase of growth, i.e. to over the half a million point? You've already hinted about this big acquisition that I was like, I didn't know whether I could say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't said who it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, well, we're really focused on it because of this acquisition. It's going to take us like, you know, we're going to go from basically pretty much half a million to almost a million in like, you know, <laughs> yeah. sort of thing. So we, you know, and that's not happening for four years time. So, but we're building everything now. So for us, it's about getting the systems in place. I think we're going to have to put our fees up again. They certainly are going to have to put their fees up in that business. So, you know, it's going to be, so it's, it's about almost doing the same thing again. Um, but you're not starting from nowhere this time. You're starting from, you know, a lot more. A lot more and it's just it's just preparing ourselves to go back up that big step again yeah and i think that's a really good point to everybody thinks that this is a straight line isn't it what you're doing and uh, oh he's people have put it onto q and a's um i didn't see these q and a's so sorry rich sorry jerry um sorry anonymous um so i didn't realize these are all coming through i was busy looking at the chat box and now people at q and a so um so Rich has asked a really good question, which is probably one for you and I. How do I know what personalities I can, can't work with without having done any profiling previously? Are there any general rules of thumb that can be applied? So I'll kick off with some ideas to give you time to think, Jessica. Um, I find it very difficult to work with quite alpha males because the external world would see me as a alpha female. I say it as it is, I don't fluff around the edges, I can come to an answer quickly. I don't necessarily conform to the, the cultural stereotype of what a female should be in society. Yes, I am female. Yes, I identify as female. Yes, I'm married with a husband with two children. So just, I'm not saying there's any you know, gender whatever there. Um, so I find it, I find that it's often the other way that a lot of that type of let's move in hard, fast type of male finds it very difficult to work with me. Um, because of my style being very, say it as it is, um, I don't work with people very well who are quite sensitive because I just end up upsetting them all the time. <laughs> um, so I think it, it's about, for me, Rich, the answer to that is just looking at where are the patterns in your working life about who you've worked well with, who you haven't worked well with. And it might be also in your personal life, you know, which of your in-laws or your you know, your, your friends, wives or husbands, do you naturally rub off badly with? These are great places to start. I mean, what would you say, Jessica? Yeah, I think um, once you've done a, a personality profile, you, you start to understand how the profiling builds up. So we use the Insights one, which is colours. Um, and I also have really noticed I get on fine with the opposite, direct opposite to me, which sometimes can be more tricky to get on with. But I find the quarter ones more difficult. So I'm a sort of, an, a sort of yellow red, but I find a red blue incredibly difficult and that's almost a direct quarter around for me I find that one in fact almost impossible to get to work with but the other way I also find it quite difficult to work with a um a green yellow which so so it's, it's for me it's the quarters around the, the you know sort of so they're not completely opposite to you but they're they're quite they're a bit different from you and, and that almost is more difficult to work with um, but I think I think Heather's idea is, is brilliant you know about looking at people that you find difficult to work with and once you've done your own profiling and found out about profiling you'll be able to identify what profile they are and you'll probably then start to see a pattern mm, mm. and I think it's really in, in it, it it's just look at your past history so, you know, I, one of it, and also look at your values as well. So one of my values is integrity, massive value, also inclusivity. So if somebody crosses my values, so they don't act with integrity, it's almost as if I can't speak to them going forward, which is really difficult. So I don't like people that play games. You come into my business, you say it as it is, you play with a straight bat. I know that's a bit of slang for those aren't, that aren't in the, the UK, but you play it. When I, I heard about an instance of basically a back channel on WhatsApp, there were there was a lot of political biting going on at my expense from some of my now former employees. And that made me furious. And anybody that's got that kind of 
you know, attitude, I know I won't get on with. Anybody that's trying to always appear at the best, I know I won't get on with. So I'll answer your question, Jerry. Did you change your pricing when you reduced your hours to cover the additional labor costs? I think, because as you say, when you discovered you needed the person um, or you were going to have, as you say, you got the diagnosis on the day your fee rise went into effect. So you'd already done that increase in pricing. You hadn't known about it. You just felt you had no choice but to. Uh, yeah, I think you realise that you've got to have profit. I mean, we tell yeah. all our clients you've got to have profit. You know? yeah. And then you look at your own business and you go, hang on, I've got no profit. And yeah. you have to have profit. You know, even I didn't want to take it, but that I still needed it because yeah. I needed it in case that exact situation happened. And that's what I realised, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So, Jessica, someone's asked, how are you, what is the, what's the channel you're finding is the most successful in gaining the right new clients? Oh, it's our client, our, our existing clients yeah. just, and referring us and our existing network, whether that's clients or other, you know, other suppliers and things like that. And we work really hard at creating a pillow made club, you know, yeah. working together a lot and working with the same suppliers, the same customers and into referring and, you know, <laughs> creating a real sort yeah. of club. By way of example, um, which of my brothers did you work with first, my eldest or my youngest? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it just gives you an idea, you know, Jessica looks after two of my brothers or I think one of them's now gone back to full-time employment so I'm not sure whether you're looking after him anymore <laughs> to the same extent but absolutely um, and actually we say to anybody in the club as soon as you get much beyond 100k in turnover your most important channel to market is servicing your good clients well the clients that you really like the clients that you want to keep the clients you want more of give them a little bit more love look after them properly those are the if you do that and you stay in touch and keep your profile high the referrals will come in so here's a great question for you um are all of your employees full-time employees did you start with full-time employees immediately or you started with part-time and what were the challenges of working with part-timers <laughs> um no i started with part-timers it's it's a lot less of a step um for part-time workers it's, it's kind of an easier way into employing someone i think so uh, I find part-time workers really helpful for that. But um, I've certainly even, even just recently working with part-time workers is still challenging. You know, maybe that's just flexible working. We've had to really redefine our flexible working policies just to say to everyone, look, you know, it doesn't matter how many hours you work, we're still expecting you to be able to work, you know, or available to work when you're telling us you're working effectively. So whether you're working full-time or part-time, whatever, you know, you've got to tell us what your working hours are and then you've got to kind of stick to them to most of the time because otherwise we can't we can't deliver client service because we don't know if you're there or not you know <laughs> so um yeah so I think yeah I think it works both ways you know I think we've always worked flexibly and so therefore whether someone's part-time or full-time actually doesn't really matter but what does matter is that you set the expectations of, of you know of how that flexibility is going to work and how you know how you expect them to work their hours and and we we're similar so I think out of the 11 of us actually there's only four of us that are full-time full-time we've got quite a few on 25 30 hours rather than the full-time full-time and I think I completely agree with you if someone's working part-time one of the expectations is they put in their diary when they're working or not working because you need to know when to ring them up you need to know when you can put a meeting in with them um I although it sounds like this utopia where you just say oh I'll get the work done when you're like you always end up second best and you have to say if I'm paying you for those hours you put them in the diary that's when I can get in touch with you whatever so one of the things we also learn is it's tempting to want to have an employee in for maybe two hours eight hours in a week the problem is when once you get to a certain size there are a number of communication meetings yeah. that you need to have where you want the whole team together now, even if that's only 30 minutes once a week, you probably once a month have, want to have them together for a lot longer, so maybe two hours. You then want to have a chat with them when they come in just to check they're all right. And before you know it, out of their eight hours, they're spending two and a half um, in meetings. Then they have, when they come in, they, they have all of that stuff they've missed to catch up with. And we've learned the hard way that actually you don't want to go much beyond two and a half, three days a week. With the yeah, I think 15 is about the minimum, yeah. I mean, 
when you were, you know, when you were very much, it was just you and them, of course you could do the eight hours because you didn't need all of this communication. Now, the other thing we learned with part-time workers is if they're part-time, they want to switch off when they're not working. Um, so if your communication channel is WhatsApp or a Apple group chat, they can't switch off unless they've got two phones. Mm. Um, so this is why it's really important whether you use Slack. I mean, we use our project management practice management system for the for the day to day conversations. But you need to have the ability to have those conversations with the whole team without it interrupting your part timers day off with the kids or whatever. Um, it's really important with that. Now, something else we learned was those of you that are not in the UK, you might not find this, but Monday is the day that we have bank holidays in the UK. So you've got to be really clear with your part timers. If they don't work Mondays, do they get an extra day off on a bank holiday Monday? Or is that part of their entitlement? And it sounds silly, but the bigger you get, the more formalized you have to get with these yeah. little things. Yeah, we're, we're spending so much time now doing policies. I literally yeah. had to do a policy yesterday on office music, background music, and what was and wasn't acceptable. <laughs> and it's crazy because you've got to find the halfway house, basically, yeah. for a lot of diverse people. And um, yeah, and the only way to do that really is by creating policies. Yeah, it, it is that. Right, we have, we have run over. Um, so, that was, it's always a delight. I haven't got any more questions coming in. I'll just check. Uh, no more questions coming in. I've answered all of them live, which is good. Those are great questions, actually.